Very important part of the bow is understanding how we leverage the bow from our back, from our scapula, moving the bow from behind us. And an important principle is this. If this is A and this is B, you have to ask yourself, does A move faster than B? Does B move faster than A? Or do they move the equal speed? The answer is B moves almost 10 times faster than A because it's the concept of distance in time. So in one second, this goes 20 inches and that only moves two inches. So this moves two, this moves 20, the frog. So it's the same principle with the hand. When you move your hand, the hand is moving 20 inches and the armpit and the scapula only moves around two inches. So the speed up here is so much slower than the speed of the hand. So when you move the bow, you want to picture this picture that it's on an arc and the hand is moving 20 miles an hour and the back is only moving, this is only moving two miles an hour. If I want to change the speed of the bow, I don't want to change the hand speed, I want to change where it starts from. So when I, when I slow the bow down, I slow it here. When I speed up the bow, it speeds here. So all movement and speed of the bow should come from the back, not the hand. So if I go like this. And then I have the bow speed. I feel my armpit going much slower. And I accelerate from my armpit. So it's very important to always feel the speeds of the bow from the fulcrum here, not the hand. When I see people play and just swiping the bow across the string, there's a disconnect between the hand and the bow. So this next picture, you can see from above the leverage so that I'm turning out. And if you notice my elbow shape, it's this angle here. And when I'm at the tip, it's the same angle. One really shouldn't change the angle of the bow because I'm leveraging from my armpit. So that's another idea of leveraging the bow out so that if you have the bow on a plane and I'm here, I go down and I push my hand out and I fall in. So my arm falls out and my arm falls down and in. So you feel like you're pushing against the wall. So I'm leveraging the bow. So here I'm turning into the bow. Here I have no weight. Here I'm balancing with my pinky. And I want to change the speed from the armpit, from the scapula. The idea of leverage is quite important, of leveraging the arm. And if you're doing scales, you want to work on that a great deal. If I'm going... I'm leveraging... I'm feeling that turning out and the turning in. Sort of like if you're a golfer uh, and how you approach hitting the ball, what angle you hit the ball at, and how you're leveraging the club. It's a very similar feeling. The next picture with momentum and inertia is an idea that's combined with leveraging. Uh, if you ever go in outer space and you just see bows floating around, they go like this. And if you tap the tip, they go out and fly around forever. You see a lot of bows flying out in space. So you have to have the same feeling with the bow that once the bow's in motion, you don't interfere with the bow. So if I articulate here with an accent, I don't want to in put any more energy into the bow. So once you drop the weight, once I drop my armpit and feel the scapula drop, it's gone. I don't interfere. I drop it, let the momentum take the bow. So if you're working on articulation, you don't want to go, you don't want to work the whole length of the bow. You want to release the bow and feel the momentum of the bow go. 
So you never want to interfere with the movement of the bow. So when you're like a pendulum, once the pendulum is in motion, you don't interfere with it. You don't keep working at it to move. You just release it. So the idea of momentum and inertia is important, of a letting go the bow. I hope when you review the pictures that you've been seeing, uh, you, it will help you clarify how you want to move the bow, how you want to balance the bow, and how you want to feel the bow move with your breath while you're playing pieces and scales.